Good morning, St. James. I hope this finds you doing well. And I do need to, to say that this week especially, I've missed all of you and the ability for us to come together and, um, and pray together and talk about uh, what's going on in the world and uh, hear each other's uh, uh, thoughts and, uh, and really listen. Uh, it's, it's hard to, to walk as the church without that ability to, to come together and, uh, and to hear and, and, and share with one another. So, uh, so while I'm glad you're, you're tuning in and I am very, very uh, grateful to, to Bob and all the people who contribute to, uh, to this worship service, I know it's not the same as having all of those uh, opportunities to come together during the week. And, and I do hope uh, that those, those happen again soon. Uh, as long as they can happen safely. And, and to that end, uh, we did at the very end of this week get, uh, uh, get some guidelines for uh, slowly reopening, uh, a checklist of things that, uh, that we need to make sure we've thought about. Uh, and, and we have to actually uh, make the decision uh, whether uh, we want to reopen or continue to worship this way. Uh, reopening won't look uh, like it did the last time we were able to come together uh, and uh, in the coming weeks, uh, we may be sending you a survey about what you're seeking, uh, given uh, all of the, uh, the restrictions in our common worship. Um, we would be able, have to come together in a way that would, would allow uh, separation, uh, and, um, and it probably wouldn't be the Eucharist, uh, and it, it, it wouldn't allow uh, a choral singing, uh, and a lot of the things that, that we can do this way uh, wouldn't be able to take place. So, so we uh, will continue to have remote worship uh, even if we do go back into the church soon. So just stay tuned and, uh, and I will let you know uh, as soon as um, we have more information about both worship and all the other ways that we come together. Uh, but we are working to that end. Um, also, uh, speaking of ways that we come together and, and, and share our thoughts together, our adult formation uh, committee is working on um, their next offering starting today. Uh, starting today, they will begin uh, discussing the Book of Joy. Uh, it's a uh, collaborative effort uh, between uh, Desmond Tutu and the Dalai Lama as, as they gathered to celebrate uh, the Dalai Lama's birthday. And uh, this uh, book was picked because uh, we felt that, uh, that people needed uh, to uh, to talk about joy and, and not just the passing joy of a, uh, of a much anticipated event, but the kind of enduring joy that, uh, that continues to buoy us through, through times like these. So uh, I hope that you participate. And even if you won't participate in the online um, or the weekly discussion uh, uh, via uh, Zoom, that you might consider uh, reading the book. So please let Jim or Alice know if you're interested. Uh, and also uh, would like you to take uh, the time to read the, the weekly uh, and, and especially take notice of the note from Randolph about the work of Common Threads and, um, and the place that the, the church at large will be able to play in the future uh, regarding uh, continued conversations about race. So, uh, so thank you to Randolph and the, and the Common Threads team for all of their work. Um, and it's, a, it's important work. Um, and with that, I, um, I invite you to join us as we begin our worship. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. From the Battaglia family to the St. James family, we miss you. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you have given to us your servant's grace by the confession of a true faith, to acknowledge the glory of the eternal trinity and in the power of your divine majesty to worship the unity. Keep us steadfast in this faith and worship and bring us at last to see you in your one and eternal glory. O Father, who with the Son and the Holy Spirit live and reign, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Hello, St. James family. I hope today finds you well and that you've been, been enjoying this wonderful warm weekend. We miss you and really cannot wait to get back in church and enjoy a nice fellowship together. So let's pray. I ask your prayers for God's people throughout the world, for this gathering, for all ministers and people. Pray for the church 
especially for Michael, our presiding bishop, Susan and Jennifer, our bishops, and Ben and Ted, our clergy. I ask your prayers for peace, for goodwill among nations, and for the well-being of all people, especially for Donald, our president, the Congress, and the Supreme Court of the United States. We pray also for those in the armed forces, their families, and all deployed in harm's way, especially Mark. I ask your prayers for all those who have suffered or feared discrimination, mistreatment, or violence because of their God-given identity. Help us to understand and to acknowledge our corporate responsibility and guide us toward sustained healing, reconciliation, and unity. Help us to remember that those who traveled away with us on this small planet Earth are all children of God. Help us judge people not by the color of their skin or where they come from, but the content of their character. Let us pray for justice and peace. I ask your prayers for the poor, the sick, the hungry, the oppressed, the lonely, the burdened, the anxious, and those in prison, especially during this season. Pray for those in any need or trouble, especially for Karen, Judy, Helen, Carol, Steve, Bonnie, Omani, Christine, Steve, Judy, John, Joan, Kay, Ansel, Tina, Linda, Fred, Kay, Ed, Barbara, Peter, Marie, and for those whom we now name either silently or aloud. I ask your prayers for all healthcare and emergency workers, those who continue to put themselves at an increased risk to provide essential services and those facing economic insecurity as a result of COVID-19. I ask your prayers for all who seek God or a deeper knowledge of God. Pray that they may find and be found by God. I ask your prayers for St. James Episcopal Church and School, our Stephen ministers and their care partners. I ask your prayers for the departed. Pray for those who have died and those whom we now name either silently or aloud. Peter Hughes. I ask your prayers for the peace and the unity of the Church of God that we may be one as the Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit are one. For the faithful and growing relationship between our brothers and sisters at First Baptist Church and St. James Episcopal Church. We give thanks for our many blessings, which we name now either silently or aloud. This church, this community, and all the members of St. James. Praise God for those in every generation in whom Christ has been honored. Pray that we may have grace to glorify Christ in our own day. From wherever we find ourselves, we offer our prayers to you, the God who promises to abide with us. During this time, may we know and trust your presence in our lives. Continue to bind us together, emboldening us as your church to be signs and agents of your hope, your healing, and your love. We pray this in the name of your Son, who came and dwelt among us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hello, St. James. A reading from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians. Finally, brothers and sisters, farewell. 
put things in order, listen to my appeals, agree with one another, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with all of you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints will greet you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. The word of the Lord. Good morning, St. James. I hope you are all doing well and staying safe. Love from the Bozetta family. A reading from the Gospel of Matthew. The eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. The word of the Lord. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, now and always. Amen. These familiar words from the second letter of Paul to the Corinthians have concluded many services of morning prayer that we've all participated in. And these words, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit are my text today on this Trinity Sunday. I'm sorry we're not in church. I'm sorry we can't hear the organ blasting out the favorite hymn, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. I'm particularly thinking of the third verse of that very familiar hymn, which goes like this. Holy, 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 though the darkness hide thee, though the sinful human eye, thy glory may not see, only thou art holy, there, there is none beside thee, perfect in power, in love and purity. I want to begin with a vignette that was posted on the internet this week on Facebook. I saw Sue Brinkman post this, and I have been meditating on this post ever since I read it. Apparently, a student of the famous anthropologist Margaret Mead asked her, what evidence does she accept for the beginning of human civilization? The student was expecting her to mention some sort of artifact, perhaps like a fish hook. But Margaret Mead paused and reflected and she said, when an animal breaks their leg, they become part of the food chain. I have discovered skeletal remains where the femur bone, that largest bone in the human body that connects our knee to our hip, she said, I've seen evidence of broken femurs that had been healed. In order, that, in order for that healing to occur, there needs to be a community of compassion that surrounds the wounded person, feeds her, protects her, cares for her in such a way that space is provided for healing. Hearing that answer, I had begun to ponder all this week where we have had so many images of human pain and anguish. I had been pondering her definition of what community is. And for Margaret Mead, the very center of community would be compassion. The compassion that surrounds a human person in their woundedness that allows healing. Having meditated on that and because it is Trinity Sunday and because thinking about the Trinity is hard work, I went to that theologian of the Trinity, probably the most famous teacher of the doctrine of the Trinity, St. Augustine, and I went immediately to his analogy for the Trinity, which is the analogy of love. 
Augustine teaches us that the Trinity involves the lover, the beloved, and the love that is always between them. In other words, St. Augustine teaches us that within the one God, there is community. In the reading for Genesis for Trinity Sunday, the story of creation ends with these amazing words. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. Every human person has the sublime dignity of being created in the image of God. And isn't it also true for us to meditate on this Trinity Sunday that every human community, not just individuals, but every human community is created to reflect at its very best that community of love that we are worshiping today as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Every human community, if compassion is at its center, represents that community of love that is the triune God, that community, that koinonia, that fellowship uh, of the Holy Spirit that binds the Trinity together. And therefore, that uh, invites all human communities to reflect to their best, to the best of their capacity, that community of love that we call the Holy Trinity. So for a Christian, for a Christian person, for a disciple of Jesus, for a Trinitarian Orthodox person, the word Orthodox means giving right glory, to rightly glorify God, we must pay attention to the quality of our communities and we must spend our best efforts to see that our communities, the communities that we are part of, reflect, represent, and show forth that community of divine compassion that is the Trinity. In the past several weeks, our nation, composed of individual communities, has re responded, and I, I use that word very carefully, responded to the profound, horrifying breach of community that occurred in Minneapolis, in Georgia, in Kentucky, that breach of community seen particularly in the eight minute and 49 second death of a human being with another human being's knee on his neck. Rather than being the community of compassion fulfilling God's dream, rather than community, what we witnessed in those eight minutes and 49 seconds was not a community that reflects the Trinity, but we, we witnessed hell on earth. When a police officer shot a young woman in her home in Louisville, Kentucky, we witnessed hell on earth. When a young man was jogging through a community, and vigilantes using a pickup truck and a rifle snuffed out his life, we experienced not the community of the divine compassion, but we experienced hell on earth. We experienced the very opposite of what we pray for. What we pray for, what we Christians pray for every time we say the prayer Jesus taught us. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The prayer Jesus teaches us is always trying to beg God to help us make God's reign on earth the same as God's reign in heaven. And when we see pictures of hell on earth, when we experience the opposite of that, then we Christians must be disturbed to the very core of our being. And as part of being, 
made in God's image, we are not just disturbed, but we're galvanized for whatever action we feel called to engage so that our communities will more reflect that community of love. As I was thinking these thoughts, praying these thoughts, and trying to figure out how to share these thoughts as I preach to you on, on Trinity Sunday, interestingly enough, I came across an essay, an essay written in Warrington, Virginia, in this, this past week, by, of all people, our very own sheriff, Sheriff Moser. Sheriff Moser reflecting on the horrific death of George Floyd penned an essay on the purpose of policing. Our sheriff said these words, we gain our legitimacy to police from the community we serve. There have been lots of police chiefs speaking in our nation. There have been lots of mayors. Uh, there have been lots of voices rec reclaiming an authority that would be appropriate for police to exercise. But I don't think any of them have been more eloquent than our own sheriff's words. I want to quote them again. We gain our legitimacy to police from the community we serve. Grounding the authority of a police officer in the community is so wise. And our job as citizens of a community is to make sure that those communities are communities of compassion and love and respect and dignity that reflect the very inner life of God. And if those communities have those characteristics, then those from the community who do the community's work of policing will be grounded in that kind of compassion. It was a profound, I think, essay. I commend it to all of you, and I hope you'll read it. I hope you'll read it, and I hope you'll ponder it. It's Trinity Sunday, and it's Trinity Sunday in a season of profound pain. As we Christians, we Trinitarian folks, look at the double pandemic of a virus and of an insidious disease that has affected this country for centuries, and that is the disease of racism. And yet, as we have experienced these two diseases, in both the disease of coronavirus, we have seen courage and faithfulness and risk as persons have risked their lives, quarantined themselves from their families to serve those who are suffering from this illness. And in this past week, we have seen those so grounded in God's vision of communities of compassion that they have walked hand in hand sometimes, white people and black people, young white mothers bringing their children to group expressions of compassion, which is what a protest is at its best, so that their children would be formed in communities of love, respect, forbearance. Yes, we have seen horror in the past two weeks, and we have also seen those who want to reflect in their communities that, that love that is at the heart of the universe, that community of love that we call Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So Trinity Sunday is not just about doctrine, it's about the life of God and how we mirror that life of God in our own spheres and in our own communities. God grant us each the wisdom to know how to be at this time a minister of triune love. And I have spoken to you with all humility.
in the name of that sovereign God who is a community of love, Father, Son, and Spirit. Amen. Good morning. I'm going to sing hymn 362, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Remember that life is short, and we have too little time to gladden the hearts of those who travel the way with us. So be quick to be kind, make haste to love, and may the blessing of God Almighty, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, be upon you and remain with you always. Our worship is now ended, and our service in the world begins. Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Alleluia, alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia. Alleluia. Alleluia.